Well, my story, I think, is a little unusual um, because I was diagnosed with a rare cancer uh, very young. Um, most people that have the type of cancer I have are diagnosed at an older age. So I started in a unique pathway in the beginning, and I was very blessed to be seen because it was a rare cancer at the Mayo Clinic. But Memphis is my home, and I ended up back in Memphis so that I could be close to my family and my children and my extended family and enjoyed uh, coming back home and, and ended up uh, going to see Dr. West and Dr. Weir at the time the West Clinic was very young. And it was also the time that the Wings Cancer Foundation was being formed and I got involved because I had been transplanted. I'd always worked professionally and I was transplanted back to Memphis. I had some time, I had an illness, it was newly diagnosed. So I offered to give my time to the Wings Cancer Foundation and had done a lot of work professionally with nonprofits, but never in the same way as participating in the nonprofit. So my start was um, at the West Clinic, young young company, young uh, nonprofit, and I just fell in love with all of them and love the work that they do. And I think that um, I, I am still a cancer patient. I've always been an active cancer patient because my cancer did not have any way to be healed or cured, but it was a slow-growing, non-aggressive cancer. So I, I was able to live the life of a cancer patient, but tell the story of a cancer patient and be actively participating in the community and outside of uh, the the nonprofit world and telling the story of the West Clinic and Wings Cancer Foundation. And I loved doing all that and eventually became the chairman of the board of Wings many years later and also worked for 10 years at the West Clinic professionally. So I have a unique perspective on all of this. Plus I was a cancer patient, obviously. Um, I still am a cancer patient, but I think what my um, story personally is a story of faith because I never worried from the day I was diagnosed because I was comfortable with my Lord and my Savior. But I was very concerned because I had a newborn child and a young child, a young boy, four or five years old at the time, and then uh, to older children. But I, I, I didn't wallow in that. I just gave it to God and said, if you'll just help me have the opportunity to know them and influence them, then I will do whatever I can for anybody else that's in this um, position. This wasn't a bargaining thing, it was just a promise that I felt that I should make and I have done that. And I think there's a takeaway that I have that's the most important takeaway for me. And I have submerged my life in cancer, but I have not submerged my personal being, who I am, the core, my essence to cancer. And that's what I think happens sometimes. And it's understandable that our bodies are ill and we have to focus on what our bodies are saying. But before you were diagnosed with cancer, you were a person, you had interests, interests. they were multifaceted, you had um, people and activities that you did, and, and cancer t seems to take all of that and, and focus you down to being a singularly focused person. And that's the trap, not to allow that. Yes, you have to give your time and your energy and go to the doctors and do all that's required, and that is very demanding of your time. But the important thing to take away from that is what you're fighting for is your life. Keep your life. Don't lose your life in the process of fighting for it. Stay active, be hopeful. Know that you're gonna survive another day, another week. Be grateful and joyous every morning that you wake up and you fog the mirror, as my husband says, uh, that you see your, yourself. See where you can make a difference. Do the things that are important and, and you're passionate about. And that's what I've taken away. So many people that I've can I counseled along the way you know, have this immediate need when they're diagnosed. I try to focus on newly diagnosed patients because that's where my heart is. It's such an unexpected interruption to your life. But I like to meet with newly diagnosed patients and give them support. Say, they told me I had six months to live. It's 24 years later, people. Statistics are for dead people. When you're dead and you're gone, then they can count you up and rack up the numbers. In the meantime, you are alive. I try to live significantly each day, not strategically. Yes, I have to go to the grocery store and Walgreens and all the things that we have to do. And I do have to go to the doctor and go to work. But that's not the focus. Every day I try to find something that's significant to me and accomplish it or do it or participate in it. 
And that's the change in life. And so many of these people, when I meet with them the first time, they, they have a bucket list, so to speak. And they say, oh, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And the interesting thing to note is six months or a year later or however long I meet with them again um, to say, where are you now? And they go, you know, I, I took that trip to South Africa and it was awesome and I'm so glad I made that trip, but really, I really am just glad to be home and be with my family. Know that you had already chosen your life. You were living your life. You, didn't, you weren't there because you didn't want to be there. You had created a path. Be comfortable in that path. Celebrate that path. Celebrate your uniqueness. Celebrate what you're doing. Celebrate the people that God has placed in your journey. And be content. Contentment and joyous. And that's the secret to beating cancer, is to live significantly and to beat cancer by living your life.